my juniors that it's an interesting speculative exercise to imagine simply this. If you live close to the people who have raised you long enough, sooner or later, you will have to go to one of them and say, Ma, I love you, but you cannot drive anymore. Give me the keys. Dad, can't do it anymore. Give me the keys. You want to go somewhere, I'll take you somewhere. Give me the keys. Now, one or two of us live with people, we cannot even wrap our brain at all around the idea of what that would be like because of the kind of people that raised us, where you can imagine what the response will be. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't get to tell me. I tell you. Dad, you're not listening to me. I love you, man, but you're going to hit somebody, you're going to hurt somebody. Give me the keys. You're not good. Your eyesight's bad. You're not good. Give it to me. What will that be like? When roles are reversed, when everything is switched. Hmm. This, of course, reminds us of that line from Wordsworth's My Heart Leaps Up. The child is father of the man. The way in which the young have to grow up and then, of course, take care of the old. And the old have to rely on the young for any number of things. Notice in our story, we have some tension. Let's write it down at level 2B as conflict. We have some conflict or some tension, don't we, between Granny and and Cordelia. By the way, if you'll look at page 836 for just a moment, the history connection here, we have to point this out because this is new information for us. House calls. Read with me. In this story, 80-year-old Ellen Wetherill dies at home, having been attended by the family doctor. Up until the 1930s, it was common practice for doctors to deliver most of their services in the home. Uh, one way to say this is, today, we go to the hospital. In the early part of the 20th century, the hospital came to you. You didn't go to the hospital. The hospital, the doctor came to you. You've maybe seen this in movies, and they show up with their bag, and they go in, and you're laying in your bed, and they talk to you, and that kind of thing, right? Okay, this was kind of an older time, right? Medical technology was simple enough that home treatment was as good as or better than hospital treatment. However, after World War I, the field of medicine changed dramatically. I would write this down. This is surprising to a lot of my students. They don't think about all of the ripple effects of war. Now, when we read Hemingway's story, remember, there was something in, uh, in another country, there was something about the technology that was being used to help men be able to recuperate from their injuries. One of the things we often don't realize is that what happened, especially after the Second World War, was the difference in medicine. Doctors and medicine and the whole world of medicine radically changed after the Second World War. There was a whole lot of people who were saved in the Second World War because of new technologies that were medicinal in nature, right? The field of medicine changed dramatically after the Second World War. New techniques for diagnoses and treatment required special technology and facilities. Economic factors also came into play. House calls were considered wasteful of the doctor's time. Today, except in some rural areas, the house call has faded into memory, right? We don't, we don't even imagine this anymore. Instead, we go to the doctor. All right, let's go ahead and continue now to watch as Granny Weatherall starts to think about her past. Now, I've often pointed this out to my juniors, and I guess they, they kind of go, well, I guess I hadn't thought about that. When you're young, think about this. When you're really young, you want to grow up. Oh, I can hardly wait until I get to middle school. Oh, I can hardly wait until I get to high school. Talk to any high school junior, and what's the one thing on their mind? Graduation. Why? Because they want to grow up. They want to get to, man, what's that going to be like when I don't have to wake up in the morning and go to school? Whew, that would be so awesome. I'm so excited. They want to grow up, right, when you're young. But when you get old, think about this. When you get old, you stop looking so much forward because you realize you're getting close to the end of what? Swinging at the park, as we've talked about it before. So where do you start spending more of your time? Looking backwards, starting to think about your life, the different kinds of things that happen in your life, what you wish you could have done different, etc., etc. Let's play the game now with Granny Weatherall. Let's continue our read. While she was rummaging around, she found death in her mind, and it felt clammy and unfamiliar. 
She had spent so much time preparing for death, there was no need for bringing it up again. Let it take care of itself now. When she was 60, she had felt very old, finished, and went around making farewell trips to see her children and grandchildren with a secret in her mind. This is the very last of your mother, children. Then she made her will and came down with a long fever. That was all just a notion like a lot of other things, but it was lucky too, for she had once and for all got over the idea of dying for a long time. Now she couldn't be worried. She hoped she had better sense now. Her father had lived to be 102 years old and had drunk a knockin' of strong hot toddy on his last birthday. He told the reporters it was his daily habit and he owed his long life to that. He had made quite a scandal and was very pleased about it. She believed she'd just play Cornelia a little. Cornelia, Cornelia, no footsteps but a sudden hand on her cheek. Bless you, where have you been? Here, mother. Well, Cornelia, I want a noggin of hot toddy. Are you cold, darling? I'm chilly, Cornelia. Lying in bed stops the circulation. I must have told you that a thousand times. Well, she could just hear Cornelia telling her husband that mother was getting a little childish and they'd have to humor her. The thing that most annoyed her was that Cornelia thought she was deaf, dumb, and blind. Little hasty glances and tiny gestures tossed around her and over her head saying, Don't cross her. Let her have her way. She's 80 years old. And she's sitting there as if she lived in a thin glass cage. Sometimes Granny almost made up her mind to pack up and move back to her own house where nobody could remind her every minute that she was old. Wait. Wait, Cornelia, till your own children whisper behind your back. It's an interesting observation. And reading the story is kind of uncomfortable for a lot of young people who spend any time around a geriatric, someone who is quite old. Notice the interesting irony. At 60, Granny thought she was going to die. So she makes her journey around all of her kids. She says her goodbyes. She comes to peace with it. She writes her well. She goes home to die. That was 20 years ago. She's hung on for 20 years. Now she's 80. <sighs> The relationship, of course, is also interesting. Let's put this in our notes. As she gets older, she seems to get more childish. Very interesting, right? As she gets older, she starts to increasingly seem more like a child. Her argument, in her own mind, is, you know what, I've lived long enough to be able to tell everybody else my opinions, and they should just have to take it. Of course, she also points out that one of the things she hates as she gets older is to be treated as if she cannot pick up on the nuances of people around her. She can tell when people are kind of whispering about her or they're trying to treat her like she's some kind of, you know, ch child that has to be placated, and it makes her really angry. Of course, a 3B question that we'll have to ask will be, what will this be like when you and whoever you've grown up with reach that moment where there's a certain kind of dynamic in play there. You'll have to answer that question for yourself. Of course, the other question is, what will it be like for you when you finally reach a certain age and you yourself have gotten somewhat old, right? You have to kind of deal with this. All right, let's keep working together now, okay? In her day, she had kept a better house and had got more work done. She wasn't too old yet for Lydia to be driving 80 miles for advice when one of the children jumped the track, and Jimmy still dropped in and talked things over. Now, Mammy, you've a good business head. I want to know what you think of this. Old. Cornelia couldn't change the furniture around without asking. Little things. 
little things. They had been so sweet when they were little. Granny wished the old days were back again, with the children young and everything to be done over. It had been a hard pull, but not too much for her. When she thought of all the food she had cooked, and all the clothes she had cut and sewed, and all the gardens she had made, well, the children showed it. There they were, made out of her, and they couldn't get away from that. Sometimes she wanted to see John again and point to them and say, well, I didn't do so badly, did I? But that would have to wait. That was for tomorrow. She used to think of him as a man, but now all the children were older than their father and he would be a child beside her if she saw him now. It seemed strange, and there was something wrong in the idea. Why, he couldn't possibly recognize her. She had fenced in a hundred acres once, digging the post holes herself and clamping the wires with just a Negro boy to help. That changed a woman. John would be looking for a young woman with the peaked Spanish comb in her hair and the painted fan. Digging post holes changed a woman. Riding country roads in the winter when women had their babies was another thing. Sitting up nights with sick horses and sick Negroes and sick children and hardly ever losing one. John, I hardly ever lost one of them. John would see that in a minute. That would be something he could understand. She wouldn't have to explain anything. Now let's pause for a moment and make this observation that Granny goes back in time to think about John, her, her, her man, right? And as she starts to think about that, she, it hits her that the age they once were as new parents is so much younger than their children are now. Cordelia, much older now. So there's like this shift, and it's starting to kind of work on her mind. She also remembers that when she was young, she could really work. For any of you that have ever dug post holes and set those up, that's hard work. But to do an entire acre, woo! So we're talking about hard work. It tells us something about Granny, and it explains why she's such a fighter. Right? She doesn't want to lie in a bed and have to be helpless. She's a woman of dynamic energy from the time she was quite young. And she's beginning now to reminisce and to wish that maybe, maybe she wouldn't be so alone. That, of course, is one of the difficulties of growing old with another person. And then one of those two people pass. Then you're alone. So that the only thing you have to hold on to are your children. And of course, one of the questions, and I, I love to say this to my juniors, and it's like they, many of them have never thought about this. One of the questions every parent has to grapple with is, did I do a good job raising my child? Think about that. By the time you are the age you are, your parents are pretty much done raising you. Can we be fair about this? I mean, of course, we're going to continue to play little games like they have some power over you to tell you when you can or can't come in and some of those kinds of things. But let's be honest. That power is quickly soon to be run out. Is that right? And you are your own person, which begs the obvious question. The choices you make are rooted in a certain kind of upbringing. Parents cannot help but ask, did we screw it up? Of course, that begs a more interesting question. How do you know as a parent whether you did it well or not? I have had juniors that say, I have never thought about that question. I would even write that question down in 3P. It's a fascinating question. How do parents know whether they did a great job raising you, an average job raising you, a crummy job raising you? How would they know that? Try to be specific in your answer even. How would they know that? One of my juniors once said, well, I stay off of a certain page of the newspaper. That is to say I don't get busted. Right? But is that proof that the child was raised well? Parents will often have to admit 
they will not know whether they did a good job or not raising you until you have become a parent. It's only then, when you're quite old, when, let's point it out, there's no one doing anything anymore, right? Whatever has transpired between you and the people who raised you, that's now happened and it's over and done with. It all informs who you are, but how it factors into who you will become is, of course, a subject of huge debate, which is why it's your folks who lie in bed at night and look at a ceiling and can't sleep because they realize it's done. They've done it. They've raised you. And whatever it is you're going to become, that's what you're going to become. Of course, notice Granny. She'd like to sit down and have a conversation with John and say, we did it okay, didn't we? We did all right. A pat on the back. That is to say, you did okay. Many parents will report that one of the greatest compliments they can receive from their son or daughter as their son or daughter is leaving home is to say, Ma, don't worry about it. I'm going to be fine. You did a great job. Dad, I'll be all right. Because why? Parents are always wondering, oh no, oh no, oh no. It's a very interesting dynamic. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll continue with our story and our study. Thank you.